It's four o'clock on Friday, and you know what that means, don't you? Thank goodness it's Friday, and it's time for another exciting episode of Taxi. What is it? Taxi TV's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Everything's a blur. That's what happens when you get old. And thank you, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. Ooh, the lighting's got me looking a little red today. Let's see how that suntan's looking. Eh, not terrible, I guess. Hello, everybody. We have Dan Weber, no surprise there. Bob Gunnerfelt, uh, Darren Fletcher, Rick Cabot Podmore. Uh, <laughs> welcome back, my friends. This show that never ends. Wind Chimes Music, the big winner from the Jason Bloom contest. Orasso Emil, Randy Stanton, Darren Moss. Hello. How are you guys? Andre Stepania and one of these days we should do, do an entire episode just about fishing. I think that that would be hysterically fun. Um, let's see. Uh, Daryl 143 Jazz, Nancy Kalel, uh, Ove Shell, Shy. I can, yeah, it's sh she, Shy? Ove, tell me how to pronounce your name all the way from Northern Norway. Uh, Greg Carroza, hello. Mark Real, Dean Crepain, fishing, yes. Do you fish, Dean? I would love to go fishing with you. Uh, Mark Stone and the Dirty Country Band. The Element, hello, everybody. How are you guys? Man, oh, man. Actually, I think I'm going to turn the air on. It's a little warm. It was chilly here all day. Every year, for those of you who have never lived, uh, Ove, says, Uwe, Ove says I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> Ken Bearden, hello. Joseph Alonzo, hello. Um, every year in June in Los Angeles, we get this thing that is commonly called June gloom. And here we are, just a couple days in front of June, and man, woke up this morning, it looked like we might as well have been in like Seattle. Um, just gloomy and gray, and it stays that way till about three or four in the afternoon. And it's now 4.03, looking out in the backyard, yes, it's just now starting to get sunny. Um, a Teresa House, hello everybody. Hello. Uh, Akira, how are you? So, a couple of exciting things to tell you. <laughs> Peter Rahel says, yep, looks like the Navy painted the sky. Oh, speaking of the Navy, I got the most incredible email this morning. 80 degrees in Seattle today. Uh, probably from everybody drinking so much coffee and their uh, metabolism so high, it's putting off all that body heat. Robert Martin, Ken Medsford, Medsford, um, about a year and a half ago, a young man who I mentored when he was still in high school about marketing, and uh, his mom actually worked at Taxi, and uh, their dad no longer lived with them, and the lady had two sons, and she asked me if I could kind of, you know, be a little bit of a, not a fill-in dad, but, you know, mentor the kids. Uh, so I did, and one of the sons really took to marketing stuff, so I worked with him as much as I possibly could. And before he even graduated high school, he started a company um, with two or three other friends from high school, selling like pimp cups and big gold chains with Mercedes logos on them and all kinds of stuff. I actually uh, invested a chunk of money in that company because I had so much confidence in this kid. And like two years later, boy, did I get a return on that investment. That was one of the better investments that I've made. So um, I've been forever grateful to have known this young man and proud of all that he's become. He's now married and has two kids and a wonderful wife. And uh, hey, Chris Jones, how are you? So anyway, uh, a few years ago, he somehow got onto an active U.S. Navy aircraft carrier uh, for a program that they have where they allow civilians to go out for an overnight or two nights uh, on a working aircraft carrier. And I believe that you get to go on the flight deck. Uh, you know, obviously you're like tucked away well out of the way, but you get to watch planes take off and land and you sleep on board the ship and everything. Um, 
is that what it's called a tiger cruise i don't know uh i'll have to read the whole email but um it's mostly i think for like community leaders and business executives or something anyway he told me about it in passing at a lunch some time ago and he said you know i think i'm going to nominate you to go on this thing well lo and behold i got an email today said you're on the list you got until uh monday to fill out this form and hey edmund and uh so it looks like at some point uh obviously right now they've got it on um on hold uh because of the virus but uh they sent out a letter of apology saying sorry we haven't processed these sooner because it's because of the virus so uh yeah at some point it looks like uh gee maybe i can do a taxi tv from a from an aircraft carrier that would be fun <laughs> anyway i'm very excited because you guys know i i'm in love with all things that fly especially if they're flying uh you know off the the deck of an aircraft carrier so i'm really excited um hello solid air uh let's see did i miss anybody i don't think so okay so we got the gang all here taxi tv from a carrier that would be cool quarantini top gun um what else do i want to tell you oh yeah jason bloom was great um he's been such a great friend for many 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 years and uh hey john pearson uh jason and i have gone out for a few dinners together lunches but mostly breakfasts uh and we would go to a place called the country kitchen uh on the island of Kauai, pretty much every year there for a while and uh great restaurant by the way if you're ever there country kitchen and don't forget hamura's house of simon which is a five minute drive from the airport on Kauai. you gotta go to that place my favorite restaurant anywhere um so every time i'm with him i'm just amazed by like his his enthusiasm his knowledge um just i don't know he's so articulate i don't know i, I find him to be inspiring anyway um Wow, Peter Rahill's dad was on CV20, uh, the Bennington out of Long Beach. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, Jason does know his stuff. Anyway, so I was just really happy to have him on the show the other day and have you guys enjoy it so much. And the contest went well. Sorry about the audio stuff. Um, you know, I'm telling you, it's we see it even when we do the uh, staff meetings on Zoom and there are nine or ten of us on a Zoom always two or three people that are just like you know laggy and stuttery and uh it's not the download bandwidth it's the upload bandwidth that causes the problem so it's tough i never know even when uh, some of the people that we've done like on a split screen video thing for taxi tv and we actually did a bandwidth check where we actually knew that their bandwidth was over 10 megs on the upside which is acceptable it's just just on the line of acceptability for um, Wirecast. Um, still had some glitchiness. So, you know, we're just doing the phone thing. And uh, so that leads me to my next thing. Oh, no, not my next thing. I've got one more thing I want to tell you about. Killer listings. I just finished editing the listings about 45 minutes ago that are going out uh, tomorrow. One, just hit your box like right now or is probably hitting your box about right now. Um, a one-off listing that came in that's got a deadline, a hard, absolute deadline of Monday. Um, I can't even remember now because I edited that one like an hour and 45 minutes ago, but um, it's an $8,000 um, feature film. I think it's in a big feature film, $8,000 thing. So make sure you pop that email open and check it out. But I, I was just marveling at the listings that are coming into Taxi. Uh, I mean, we're in the middle of a quarantine. Well, some of us are in the middle of a quarantine. And the country is still, you know, knocked back on its heels from this virus thing. And, of course, you know, uh, what's going on with that officer putting his knee on that guy's throat and, and sadly killing him. That's obviously, uh, you know, top of the news today. Anyway, with all this stuff going on, somehow... The industry is still chugging ahead full steam and we're just getting one great listing after another so make sure you open your listing emails uh this afternoon saturday sunday and monday because i've seen all the listings they're all great um 
L. Harrison, finally home and able to access the live quarantini. Yay! 70, John's looking at the listing. 70s rock with male vocals. There you go. Um, <laughs> Peter Rahill says, I rode my skateboard in the hangar bay on the carrier. Wow. I once rode a skateboard in the back of a moving truck, but not nearly as cool as riding in the hangar bay on an aircraft carrier. That's pretty awesome. Um, let's see. I'm trying to read. Uh, hello, Michael McGraw. Um, okay, so killer listings. Got that, Jason. It was great. Got that. Um, Monday's regular episode of Taxi TV. We are, in fact, going to be joined by a mystery music library owner. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was willing to do it, uh, exposing himself. But I'm telling you, man, we just it makes me cringe when these folks join me on the show, uh, you know, when their faces and their names are revealed and then they get in their car and by the time they get back to their office or their home, they've got a bunch of emails from people going, dude, I saw you on taxi TV. How can I get my music to you? Um, music library owners, especially earn their living from pitching music, not answering questions that people could get answered on taxi TV or get answered, you know, by Googling it on the internet. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the questions that could easily be answered elsewhere, but the obvious one is, how do I get my music to you? Um, I don't know if that's easily answered, but, um, you know, tell me what the difference is between exclusive and non-exclusive. It's like, really, you've got a moment to talk to either a music supervisor or a music library owner, and you want to ask them something that you can find the answer to elsewhere. So. I want to um, have you guys, I'm enlisting your help today on this show. Um, I want you guys to come up with some questions today that I will ask him on Monday. All right. Um, so let's, we can shoot the breeze for a few minutes when the room fills up a little bit more Then let's do the uh, questions you would have. And honestly, I think Ariana is my producer today. So, Ariana, if you're uh, watching the big show today, if you could copy and paste those uh, things that pop up in the chat room, paste them into an email and send them to me either later today or over the weekend uh, or even Monday, that would be great. Um, these questions will be for somebody I would call a high-end music library owner. Um, he's been in the business for easily 20 years, if not longer. Um, he's really, really, really smart. Um, he's very giving. He's an advocate uh, for you guys. I mean, he's just a total class act, and I've always enjoyed his, his friendship and his company. He and I talk a lot on the phone. Um, it's always business stuff, but we are friends, and we've been out to dinner with our wives and all that good stuff. Um, Wow, I cleaned windows on high-rise buildings for 30 years. I've repelled off of more than 300 different buildings over the years. Wow. You know, I'm not really afraid of heights, but I do get vertigo um, pretty easily. So that would be a job that I could never do. And hats off to you. All right. Um, so what else do you guys want to talk about before we get into your suggestions for questions? Or if you want to start thinking about them now, writing them down. Um, wow, Ken Mesford's The Human Metronome. There's a question for the music library guy. Um, what makes you want to pull your hair out when dealing with submissions, assuming you have hair? I got to tell you, he and I spent an hour on the phone about three hours ago uh, today. 
And he was, he, at the end, he kind of apologized, said, man, sorry to lay all this on you. But he was, in fact, uh, describing all the things that make him pull his hair out. And some of the stuff, just astonishing, like mistakes that people make, just dopey, common sense mistakes. Um, things that can literally kind of ruin a career. Uh, so, all right, hopefully uh, Ariana got that one down. Uh, do you see a trend coming as far as what genre is most sinkable in the short term? That's a great question. <laughs> Time for a little rock star. Time to wipe Rockstar off of my face. I think it's going to be time for the famous Rockstar burp coming up here. <laughs> There's a music request for specific songs from the past. I submit my version of the song, though these already recorded songs. What are the copyright implications? Whoever composed the song um, or controls the copyright, they could have, you know, they would likely still control the writer's side, but the publisher, if they are the publisher or they sold their publishing at some point, controls the publisher side. You control the master, so you get paid for a master placement, not for the placement of the actual song. Um, Darren Moss, uh, what genre do you think is in demand but in short supply? Um, that's a good one. L. Harrison says, I'm hearing lots of COVID-19 music trends on the news shows and related ads. In general, the somber yet somehow triumphant challenge. Oh, absolutely. I'm telling you, at the risk of sounding um, full of myself. <laughs> uh, taxi was on top of that before the libraries or the industry even thought about it. Seriously, uh, I think I stepped off the plane coming back on February 29th or 30th. I forget which day it was that I landed, but um, uh, it was that was the day we had the first death in America from COVID-19. And I remember driving on the 405, heading back to our house from the airport and hearing that somebody had actually died, I think in Washington state. Um, and I thought, man, if this thing takes off like it sounds like it might or could, um, this is gonna be like 9-11 uh, and we're just gonna have so many people cranking out TV shows and stuff. Um, about, you know, so we were on it and we were reaching out to libraries and, and many libraries were like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Okay, great. Run listings. And now it's like everywhere in the industry. So uh, I guess it was inevitable, but we did get on it early. Um, what sort of feedback do you get from music libraries? Is it all uh, fail pass or is it, or is edits commonplace? Generally, um, it depends on the library and the kind of music they're looking for, how big they are, how much time they have. Some of the libraries we work with will give a little feedback once they get to know you or maybe in the very beginning of the relationship. And then once you're in the saddle, they don't really, they're not in the business of giving feedback. They don't have the time. Every minute they spend giving feedback is a minute they can't spend making money for you and for them. Uh, John Pearson says, uh, does library owner look at songs by title in alphabetical order? Does this software aggregate them that way? Um, I can ask that question, but I know that when we send out discos, um, the playlist, I think that they probably, maybe I'm wrong, but they probably just start listening first, second, third, fourth. Um, Martin Gravel says, you're not full of yourself. You're just really good at reading the game. I have my moments. <laughs> They're just moments, though. <laughs> uh, question. 
who's likely to purchase music under a blanket agreement through a library? TV network, I'm guessing. Um, okay, we'll ask that question. Question from Darren Moss, how do you decide which order taxi submissions are sent on a playlist to a music supervisor? Um, generally speaking, they're pretty random. There are occasions where we hear something that we think is just so spectacularly right on the money that we'll put it first on the list. Um, there are times that we'll put stuff on the list very rarely, so don't don't think this happens like on a weekly basis. It happens a few times a year. Literally count them on one hand with those five fingers. Um, sometimes we'll put stuff on the list that probably shouldn't have been forwarded, but it's good and it's something that we think that library owner might need elsewhere in their catalog. Uh, we wouldn't do that probably for a music supervisor because that's it's just not the right thing to do to a supervisor. They're not looking for other great music that might fit elsewhere. They're looking for something that, you know, is a solution to a problem or fills a hole they've got in a scene or, you know, um, in, enhances the emotion in a scene. But a music library, sometimes, you know, we're, we're pretty friendly with all the ones we work with. And sometimes we hear something and go, you know, that would be really good in his library. I know it, he's not looking for that right now for the, the pitch he's trying to make, but he'd probably want to hear this. So we may include that at the bottom of the list and, and send an email before the file is sent over saying, by the way, check out XYZ song or instrumental track at the bottom of the list. We know it's not on target for what you need, but thought you might like this for your library. Um, uh, I'm guessing this is a question for him. Do you ever have big hotels as customers for custom lobby music? How about big supermarket chains? Frankly, um, they probably wouldn't reach out to a library. They would go to, you know, Muzak-like companies. There are many people doing that now. There are a few that are kind of the leaders of their industry. Um, but it's music aggregation companies that they do studies. They look at, you know, what your uh, demographic is of your shoppers and other psychological uh, considerations, and they put together playlists based on what they have noticed resonates well with similar types of stores and similar demographics. So I doubt that they would reach out directly to a library. Um, do you know how to use the speed option to catch up? I don't. Do different libraries specialize in specific genres? There are some. I mean, there are, uh, like Latin music, for instance. There are a couple companies that only do Latin music. Um, I wouldn't say that there are libraries that do, like, you know, we just do drones or we just do love songs. Um, but they don't, they're not, most of them are not interested in just anything that's really good, believe it or not. They hear stuff that they think is great and they don't sign it. Why? Because they don't have clients that can use it. So they don't want to take the time to sign something and you think, well, how hard could it be? It's just signing a piece of paper. But they, they've got to check with the PROs. They do have to do their due diligence and it's a lengthy little process. So especially when you're dealing with the numbers they are. So um, generally speaking, the music they sign is uh, dictated by the customer base that they have. Um, Rick Cabot Podmore, Podmore says, wired music services. Yeah, it used to all be satellite. I think it is more now uh, via phone lines. Um, Wind Chimes thinks a good question would be, top three things he wishes songwriters knew or did to make our submissions more attractive. Only question I could come up with, but that's a good one. Um, 
Mark Real wants to know, do I need something like easy song licensing permission if my rendition of a song is submitted for a use in a commercial? I'm not sure I understand what that means, but yes, the easier you make it for the people that want to license your music, the greater the chances that the deal will go through. They don't want you, they don't want to hear your music and then find out that you've got four co writers and that you didn't get a work for hire agreement from the vocalist on it. The minute there are complications of any size, that's off putting. And the bigger and the more complications you have, the greater chance you're going to lose that license. Question Apart from universal lyrics and being contemporary, any other tips on what makes a good piece of music with vocals for film and TV use? Good question. Um, um, John Pearson's asking, uh, do we ever add notes? Does the screener ever add notes to make it easier for library owner supervisor, like check out the lift on the song in verse two? Maybe not that specific, but there have been times that we hear something where the intro is just horribly long or the verse just meanders. And it's like, oh man, and then you hear the chorus and go, that is such a slam dunk. And we know that more often than not, the chorus is what gets used. So yes, might we, uh, the, the screeners are trained to come to us, to the guys in the A&R department and alert them. Um, sometimes they'll involve me, sometimes they don't, but ultimately uh, when the team that sends the music out to the industry person feels that there is something that the recipient needs to be alerted to, they will alert him or her uh, either in an email right before the batch gets sent out in disco or maybe as a note in disco. Uh, question. When looking for a song for a scene where only a piece of the song will be used, what is he looking for? Um, yeah, it, it's almost always a piece of song. It's, it's, not never, but really rare that an entire song would get used. As I've, I've said before in the show, that's more than likely to happen with like a cocktail jazz piece that's running in the background of a restaurant scene during a long, intimate conversation. That might be a three minute song use. Um, uh, you know, other songs, not so much. Um, there are very few scenes that actually last that long. And there are a lot of cuts, a lot of edits within a scene. So unless it's a montage, um, whoops, who could that be? Let's find out. This is Michael. Hi, can I see, is this Michael Lasko? Yeah. Hi, I need to advise you that I'm actually in the middle of a live stream broadcast right now with a bunch of people watching us have this conversation. I tried calling you at 10 at 1030 on uh, Wednesday morning, but got your voicemail. Can we do uh, 10 1030 on Monday morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking through here and I didn't, I checked my voicemail and I didn't have anything. So yeah. hopefully you have my right number. Okay. <laughs> It's your right number because it gave me your first name and your last name, so I'm sure it was you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Marguerite. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll talk to you on Monday. All right. Thank you. <laughs> that's funny. Um, <laughs> that's really funny. Our bank that never calls me for anything calls me in the middle of a show. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, looking for a song for scene where only Pete's the song will be used. What is he looking for? See, they don't always know that, um, the library doesn't know. Um, you know, most of the times when they get a brief, it's, it's not like, Hey, music library, you know, the music supervisors don't send out a brief most of the time that says, so I've got a scene where a girl comes home from school and she's all upset because she was bullied. And when she walks through the door, her dad says, what's the matter, honey? And then a song starts to play 
Um, so we need a song about blah, blah, blah. At best, and I don't frankly think this happens very often, it might say we need a song about, um, that, not a song about bullying, but a song that could play in a scene about bullying. Um, but more often than not, it's going to say, you know, need a song about staying strong. Um, need songs about uh, empowerment. You know, they, they don't get all that specific. There are times that they send out more specific stuff, but not that often. Um, okay, let me catch up to you guys. Love My Gravity Chair. Now there's a song title. Um, let's see, Peter wants to know, I have a meeting with a lawyer about a collab with a local artist. Um, what would be a trick question? I see if this lawyer knows the biz. Um, man, I don't have a good answer for you on that one, Pierre. Uh, I do not love lawyers. <laughs> there are very few lawyers that I actually like. Um, you got to remember, every lawyer in the world, I believe, at least the ones that, uh, you know, maybe not somebody who's a lawyer uh, trying to save the planet, you know, on green initiatives or something like that. Um, certainly litigation attorneys, uh, divorce attorneys, um, general business attorneys, their goal is to have as many billable hours as possible. If you ever go through a divorce, just know that the two attorneys will talk to each other behind their client's backs and say, so how much do they have? What, how much, you know, that's the first question they ask you um, is how much equity do you have in your house? And I can guarantee you, you think, oh, because they want us to split the equity. No, it's the lawyers that are gonna split the equity because when you're all done with the divorce, you will have like five dollars of equity left in your house and the rest will be owed to the two lawyers they will do whatever they can to drag it out and the minute they know the money is gone they will reach a settlement for you and say you got to sign this trust me um, uh, question from happy ron i've heard from some people the music supervisors don't like loops. Oh my goodness, my halo's not turned on today. Um, others have said loops are fine as long as they're from a reputable source and paid for. Yeah, I mean, that's got a lot to do with it. And certainly, you know, it's one thing to use a loop um, legally and creatively. I mean, sometimes people will take a, a loop and basically, you know, just put one thing on top of it. So it's almost all the loop. Baby Punch My Face. Uh, who was the, wasn't that by uh, Wild Man Chris? Excuse me, Darren Fletcher says, this exercise is making us think. Good one, Michael. Sorry if I ruined your weekend, Darren. <laughs> oh, I'm so funny. <laughs> uh, oh man, I'm so behind here. Right, John Pearson's given a great answer about the loop thing. Um, Apple loops through Logic, he uses them all the time. You just can't use samples and loops that aren't cleared and paid for. Yeah, all my libraries ask that question. Absolutely, and one of the other things that libraries, two libraries in the last 90 to 120 days, I think probably right before we went out on quarantine, um, I had a couple libraries in a row that talked to me about uh, the possible inclusion of language in the listings that said, for them, that said, if you use, oh, I remember what it was, if you use samples um, or loops and we ask you for stems, don't send us a stem of just the loop or just the sample in the clear by itself because the editor won't know. The editor could put it in the show and now you've taken something from Apple that you've got a right to use, but you're making money with it, but not in as part of your composition or production. I think I got that right. Like I said, I've said many times, not a lawyer. My mom was very disappointed, but yes, I'm not a lawyer. Um, Ken Messer says, yes, you can layer and alter them. Uh, A 
Anthony asked the question, uh, was looking at the chill hop instrumental cues and ref tracks are basically 16 bar loop with mix effects happening throughout. Is this what I should be writing for up to four minutes long? Um, I would have to, I mean, typical instrumental cue, they like them as 60 on the short side, 90 is kind of typically, you know, the median uh, length, um, maybe two minutes. Four minutes might be if somebody's looking for chill hop instrumentals. And the difference between an instrumental and an instrumental cue is generally the way they're constructed. Instrumentals are more like an instrumental version of a song, you know, with an intro, a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus out. And a cue is typically like a very elongated A section with possibly, you know, like a B section, a middle eight thrown in there for variation. Um, and, you know, build it up, build it up, drop it down, build it up, build it up, drop it down, middle eight, build it up, build it up, and we're gone. There you go. That's my version of a cue. Dino, do it, did I get an A on that? <laughs> um, I shouldn't be, you know what, I could touch this thing so what do you think was the lady from the bank lying to me I'm sure I left a voicemail and I'm sure it had her name on it Greg Carosa gives me a plus one I got that right my answer I guess uh my answer on the difference between an instrumental and an instrumental cue. <sighs> oh, I was right about you can't use loops, uh, you know, if you're giving, uh, splitting anything up for an alt mix or a stem. Um, Okay, I might have passed up some of you guys. Sorry, uh, if I don't answer your question, please ask again. Um, Jay Humphrey says, I just joined Taxi and submitted my first instrumental. Does anyone let me know if it was forwarded? Absolutely. But um, read the website, Jay, but uh, welcome to Taxi. Glad you're on board. I'm really glad that you're here for the show in the chat room because this is where all the really smart stuff gets answered. Well, smart questions get asked, I should say. Um, yes, uh, typically, but oftentimes people make the mistake of, uh, let's say something's got a deadline of June 20th and they submitted it today, which is what, May 29th? Um, they think that they're going to hear three weeks from today. No, it's typically three weeks-ish from the deadline date. So that means typically anywhere between like a week and four weeks with three kind of being the average um, after the deadline. That's the important part. Um, When submitting for reimagined covers, are there any songs that are restricted, or is the way to look up is there a way to look up pro, uh, protected songs? I I don't know exactly how they would restrict or protect, but I've been told don't do Beatles covers, don't do Neil Young covers. There are a few bands out there um, that don't like it, and and basically how they enforce that is their publishers will not give, uh, will not license the song. Um, although I think the Beatles have loosened up in the stuff. Neil Young, I don't know. Question from Darren Moss. Do music supervisors or library owners reach out to Taxi looking for music by phone or email or other? Um, typically email. Um, I would say that's by far the most common. Uh, I mean, there are times that we have phone conversations with them and other, yeah, we've used carrier pigeons. Michael, can I share something with the group? It all depends what you're sharing. I mean, is it chocolate chip cookies? Then by all means.
Neil Young uh, can't loosen up. That's what makes him Neil Young. <laughs> I got to go turn on the halo. I'll be right back. <laughs> There, I feel better now. It's just weird after like two months of doing this to not see those little lights above my head. I feel like a Christmas tree. Joseph Alonzo, just got three songs for you today. I'm a returning member, very happy. Yay, good for you. Fit for a king, dun 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 dun. <laughs> St. Michael, far from it. <laughs> Yesterday is one of the most covered songs. Yeah, um, you're right about that. I actually know a guy whose father, if I remember correctly, actually got the publishing on about eight or ten early Beatles songs, most of which, maybe all of which you would know. Some of them were like big Beatles songs. And before they became famous, he got the publishing on those. And uh, wow, actually he came to Taxi because he controlled those and he wanted uh, reimagined covers of Beatles songs. I was like, dude, this is gonna be the most popular series of listings we've ever run in the company's history. Um, I can't remember the songs now, but they were there were some really good. If he had eight of them, there were like, you know, five that you would know for sure. Um, excuse me. And uh, and we were getting along fine. Everything is cruising along fine. And then there was some legal hiccup. Uh, I think his publishing company had a partner and the partners didn't want it to go that way. They wanted famous artists to do the covers, blah, blah, blah. So easy come, easy go. It broke my heart. Um, developmental Archangel Michael. <laughs> uh, oh, with a halo? Or did you mean, uh, do you want to talk to the music library owner about what a developmental arc is? <laughs> uh, Michael Jackson didn't buy all of those. That's the thing, is this stuff was, um, yeah, it wasn't in the catalog that Michael Jackson bought. From where did he get it from? I can't remember. Um, do you like do you uh, do you like any solo Beatles? Um, yeah, I love some of the Paul McCartney stuff. I, yeah, you know some of the stuff from all of the Beatles solo. Um, I can't say that I ran out and bought like. You know what? I didn't love Double Fantasy. There were some of the songs on there I really liked a lot, but I didn't love the entire album. Um, Surprisingly, Ringo had some good stuff on his solo efforts. Um, George, your question's so broad. Uh, what are the most important things Taxi's clients look for in forwarded songs? That varies with every single listing. Um, it's not like we all want a good chorus, which they do, but um, yeah, that's just too broad. Oh, Akira's talking about my halo. There it is. Um, yeah, Wings was great. Um, I can't believe, I once saw pictures of the studio that they used in, where was it, somewhere in Africa. To re, Was it Ram that was recorded in Africa? I can't remember, but man, I saw the pictures of that studio. I was shocked that he went there. It looked like they didn't have anybody aligning the tape machines. You know, if a cable went south or a channel dropped on the tape machine or the console, so be it. <laughs> Cass McKenty, sorry I'm late. Mom wrote me a note. Yeah, I want to see your mom's signature. Make sure that it's actually your mom's signature, all right? Uh, That band was amazing. Yes, they were. Of 
Man, I've heard some stories. One of our earliest screeners, I think she was maybe in the original eight or 11, however many screeners there were, was a woman named Denise Oso. And uh, she was married to a guy whose name escapes me. He eventually became a screener taxi. He was the bass player for a while in the Plastic Ono Band and was on the road with Yoko and was around her for at least a couple of years. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book, The Lives of John Lennon, which is considered totally blasphemous by people that are big Beatles fans, which I am. Uh, and I read that book and I was like, I can't believe some of the stuff that was in there. Um, and this gentleman who spent a couple of years, you know, pretty much with Yoko on a daily basis said, he read the book, he said, I can tell you from personal experience, everything that I saw happen that made it into the book was accurate, so therefore I think everything else is accurate. Wow. Um, Michael, <laughs> Matt Bantle wants to know, what's the record of the most submissions by a single member in one year? I don't know, but I do know that one gentleman uh, sent in 100 submissions on his first day, all on cassette, mind you, um, and then uh, went berserk when we said, we think you might be unrealistic and taxi might not be the best fit for you, and we proactively gave him a refund. I sent him a copy of John Brahaney's book and a very nice, uh, you know, thank you for joining, but note. And the guy went berserk. He was not the most stable person in the world. He went berserk and started threatening me and then started threatening my family. And eventually, sadly, he uh, ended his life. So that one I will never forget, but I can't tell you about the most number of submissions in a single year. Um, that would be an interesting competition though. I would love to know the answer to that one myself. Um, for the library owner, here's a question from Robert Valacor. Valacors, uh, what has been one of your most successful placements? Okay. Um, Linda McCartney's mic was off in, <laughs> in live shows. Well, I'm not sure if it was her mic that was off or her pitch. We've all heard the tapes. Um, hundred on the first day yep jesse i played yoko's album once the neighbors called the cops thinking me and the wife were fighting <laughs> or your cat was getting murdered wow Rick, greg carosa says i had 165 submissions in 2019 not nearly so many in 2020 as I've signed with publishers and now having to spend more time writing for them or working for them. Well, there you go. looks like Neil Young's loosening up in his old age. I see that some of his stuff has in fact been uh, used in, in TV. I don't think you'll see him on a band deodorant commercial anytime soon. Um, are there some stats that you keep and share? Uh, like what kind of stats? And I'm not so sure we'd share them just because I know that there are a couple of competitors at least that watch these shows. So hi, competitors. Uh, I hear footsteps. <laughs> oh, look at that. The ghost is back. The door is magically opening. Wow, check that out. I did that with the power of my mind. <laughs> Bye, honey. Bye. This is Taxi Mama. <laughs> Bye, Taxi Enjoy Mama. Bye, Taxi Boss. <laughs> oh, man. I'm all red now. Um, Yep, somebody actually submitted 100 tape burritos. I remember it was in a big box. <laughs> Finally a face on her, yep. <laughs> Does she get a royalty for that? No. No, she doesn't. She's married to me. Who needs royalties? <laughs> Uh, 
yes, that was sweet Nancy. Uh, question: Any submissions you play sometimes for your own enjoyment? Oh, absolutely. Um, question to music library or, or Michael. Well, I can tell you personally that um, there have been times where we've had internal CDs that we circulate around the company so that everybody can kind of hear what you know what's hot uh, right now. And some of those are actually still in the center console of my car. Some that have been sitting in there, I mean, through various cars since like 2010. So yeah, there are some taxi songs that I actually much prefer over most of the other music I've actually owned. <laughs> Anthony says you guys are so cute together oh yeah you should see us when we're not on camera <laughs> uh, we actually get along pretty well we have our moments like all couples but I gotta say we never have you know like screaming fights maybe moments of tension she needs walk on music there you go <laughs> Oh, Robert Valacourse knows my wife on the phone. Really? What's been going on there, Robert? Says, Deb is great. Super nice on the phone. <laughs> I remember early in our relationship, we were probably like a month into our relationship. And uh, I had an apartment in New York City and an apartment in L.A. And I had just opened up the New York office of the post-production company that I was running in LA and I built out a 10,000 square foot facility, uh, mostly picture editing for TV commercials uh, in New York. And I still had my apartment there from when I lived there and I would go back and forth every other weekend to be with my daughter. So at one point I was there for an extended trip getting this place built out and opened up and staffed and everything. And Deb, uh, I think she might have been in graduate school and she, I want to say was in Israel for a month or something. And we talked and I said, um, do you miss me? And she goes, nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're both pretty, uh, we're definitely not, what do they call it? We're not a codependent couple by any stretch of the imagination. We both survive very well on our own, but get along great together. We're better together, but do fine on our own. Uh, and there's all the dirt you're getting on us for a while. Uh, do you get feedback from your clients like your members should do this or, or that better? Um, if so, could you share, share some of their observations? Um, you're going to get some of that stuff from the music library owner. And it's not just about you guys. It's about, um, I mean, although I would say that this person's library is probably, I'm just guessing here, but 30, 40% of his catalog may be taxi members. Um, but he was just like beating his head against the sidewalk today, just like, oh my gosh, it's some just dopey stuff that people do. And, and he really wants to come on the show to like tell you guys about this so you don't make these mistakes. So I'm really looking forward to this. Akira, <laughs> Michael says, Wahoo to Ono. Oh it's a fish joke. <laughs> Yeah, my, you know, Deb, sadly, is such an animal lover. Not that I'm not. It's like, I hate animals. No, everybody loves animals. But um, she doesn't like to go fishing with me. Um, I remember on our honeymoon, we were somewhere in Mexico, and we went fishing one day. And every time we would catch a fish, she would kiss it on the forehead, say, I'm so sorry my husband scared you, and then lower it back into the water and gently watch it, you know swish around till it swam away. Um, so she doesn't like to go fishing, but uh, I have taken, uh, I have four daughters, two from my previous marriage that are now um, 39 and 36, and then two from this marriage with Deb, and those two are 23 and 19. So uh, the now 36 year old has gone fishing with me, the 23 year old has gone fishing with me, and the 19 year old has gone fishing with me. 
the two younger daughters have gone a few times, at least a couple, if not a few times. And they would, they on their own, they will never do it again in their lifetime. But when they go with me, it's like, okay, dad, I'm going to make you happy and go fishing. And as soon as they catch that first fish, they're like, they're hooked. <laughs> Rick says, and we're back to the fishing. <laughs> Question for the library owner from John Pearson. Uh, wow, I can't believe it's 455. Does he ever reach out and say, if you change this or that, I'll sign it? Uh, maybe just subtle mix changes. I, I, you can, we can ask him that, but I know that he does. Um, Robert Bell, of course, says, you have a lot of daughters. You have perspective, only two here. Yeah, I know more about fashion than any straight man should. Trust me. Um, Mark Reel says, Groundhog or gopher under my porch this morning. Did you send them? No, but buy me a plane ticket to wherever you are and I can show you how to get rid of them, how to relocate them. How many fish does it take to screw in a light bulb? I have no idea. Um, this is a great question uh, from... ZLV T music. Uh, is there any time of year when there are more submissions than others? Not really. Um, not really. Maybe I want to say maybe a little bump toward the end of the year, like you know, from August. The, the basically heading into the fourth quarter, when a lot of people are looking for Christmas stuff. Maybe we get a little bump there, but generally, I don't think in 28 years I've ever noticed, you know, like a seasonality to the amount of submissions. Um, Darren Moss wants to know, would you encourage members to use demo studios or create their own home studio? Absolutely home studios, and here's why. Although I know several demo studios that do really good work, they're making masters, not even demos anymore. Um, uh, boy, questions are pouring in now. Um, the problem is you go to that studio, you pay them, let's say, 500 to to $1,000 to do this demo. You submit it to Taxi a few times and you get the same feedback, like the song needs a bridge. Well, now you've got to go back to the studio and pay them again to, to add a bridge. Uh, if you had a home studio, you could just do that stuff. You can change mixes, make all these modifications at will um, on demand. I, I much prefer... I fervently recommend that you get a home studio and learn how to use it well. Um, here's a question to Michael. Uh, just curious, do you listen to submissions at all anymore or just the screeners? The screeners um, do all the screening. Um, we do have A&R, well, actually more like staff hangouts. Um, this past year or so, we've been doing these things like once every couple of months where everybody comes into my office at the end of a Friday maybe. Uh, maybe we crack open a beer and we hang out. And sometimes they're kind of themed listening parties, you know, where we spend maybe an hour to an hour and a half in my office with the whole staff just hanging out. Um, one of them was advertising music. Sometimes it's maybe the taxi top 10. Um, other times, it, it's like stuff that we feel like we want to involve the whole staff because we kind of have like, two areas. We have the customer member services side of the staff and we have the A&R music side of the staff. And I don't want there to be a divide. I want both sides to understand what's going on. So I really like it when we actually remember that we're a music company and spend our time listening to music. I do hear submissions, by the way, when really good stuff, you know, that for myriad reasons, um, there are plenty of times where I hear music from members. I just don't sit down and screen the actual listings. Uh, Martin Gravel said, extending John's question, could the music library owner ask for corrections in the mix and mastering? Absolutely, more likely the mis mixing than mastering, but yes. Uh, Um, 
Are there ever any requests for Thanksgiving songs? Why no, Ken, and you were a turkey for asking. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I don't remember ever having that request. Um, we do get requests for Halloween songs. Wow, it's five o'clock already. Um, Ken Bearden says, Michael, you give so much, thank you. You know, Taxi has evolved over the years. People always say, what's Taxi gonna do in the future? And, and I disappoint them with the answer. Pretty much the company we are today is almost exactly what I wrote in the original business plan late in 1991, I think around October, November of 1991. Um, most of our improvements are incremental, like 1%, 2% improvements, but you know, you do a couple percent every year for 10 years, you've done 20% improvements. But you know, things like uh, adding taxi dispatch, adding the convention, um, the recent change we did with the critique forums, uh, John Pearson, Turkey Gravy, or a Snook. Snook will win that hands down every time. Um, so the educational thing was always a component of what we did vis-a-vis -vis the critiques, um, which predated the convention, predated Taxi TV, which predated the forum. But we've come to realize over the years that the better educated you guys are on a musical level and on a business level, um, the better Taxi is going to serve its members and our industry clients. Um, it just works out well for everybody. It's like only our smartest members take advantage of this stuff. And lo and behold, the people that take advantage of all these things are invariably the ones that are getting the most deals. Um, have you thought about doing a Zoom convention? I've thought about it. Um, I mean, we still, at, at this point, literally as recently as like three hours ago, I uh, texted back and forth with the woman at the hotel. Um, we're all just being kept in a holding pattern by our lovely mayor. Um, you know, what I don't want to do is have a panel of industry people sit there with a videographer, you know, and everybody's sitting at the table. I'm, I don't know. I, I, if the road rally can't happen in a physical space, which would break my heart because, come on, let's face it, the education is great, but that's half of it. The other half, which may be more important, frankly, um, is the meeting people, touching people, which we'll never do again, I'm sure. <laughs> um you know, uh, I mean, I've actually entertained the thought that if we can't do the rally in the physical form this year, maybe doing something like doing three and a half or four days of these things, doing like three sessions a day like this online with, with me and an industry person, rather than doing panels, because that's clunky. It really is. Nobody knows when to talk. People talk over each other. Even when we do staff meetings with nine of us, it's never, largely because of bandwidth issues, it's just not great. I mean, we've all seen it on the news. You know, there's a major news broadcast live and they bring somebody in via Zoom or Skype and in 30 seconds into it, it's like. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll figure out something um, if we can't do it. Uh, or we could just edit together all of these things, you know, take out all the besties and put them together, and there you go. Anyway, guys, it is 5.04 on a Friday evening. There goes the squirrel. He's an hour late. Um, yeah, this chat as the Zoom, sure. Um, have a great weekend, and like I said, uh, make sure you open all the listing emails this weekend. Um, because there are a bunch of great listings in there. There's like 8,000, uh, 10,000, another 10,000, and not just the big money, but just good stuff. So that's it. I will see you Monday. Um, don't forget, mystery music library owner. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, have a great weekend, you guys.
I will miss you on Saturday and Sunday, but we shall return on Monday for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys.